Hello, you are listening to the Animalia Hour on KGVM. We are a podcast based in Bozeman, Montana, committed to environmentalism, human health, and redefining our relationship to other animals. We hope through this podcast to inspire you to live vegan for the same reasons. I'm Kevin. I'm Lucy. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah. Welcome back to our show. Um, Today, our topic is the subject of rights. So I know that may not be something that you think about on a daily basis. I would say that I don't really think about rights on a daily basis, but it is a really interesting topic and um, something that I think everybody can benefit from talking about, thinking about more. So right. we're going to talk about rights today. Um, and one of the things that might spring to mind um, for some of us uh, when we start thinking about rights uh, would be our founding fathers um, in our country, the United States. Um, our founding fathers were very interested in the subject of rights. Um, if we think about you know, Thomas Jefferson, who's credited with being the primary author of the Declaration of Independence and some of the things he said there, and uh, but also other documents like the Constitution, which is all about um, the rights of the individual, uh, especially the Bill of Rights, the, the first 10 amendments, so uh, which was primarily authored by James Madison, our Constitution. So I think it might be helpful just to really simplify the conversation, just start with something that maybe we can all find common ground on the subject with um, just kind of using the language of our Declaration of Independence, um, where Thomas Jefferson wrote that basically that humans have inalienable rights. And um, he framed it under the paradigm that we're given those inalienable rights by our creator. Um, But we know that you know, even secular humanists or, you know, people who come from different paradigms um, can all agree that humans have um, rights just by virtue of, of being here. So those three inalienable rights, life, the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to pursue happiness. Yeah, and uh, Lucy, right, in France, they have a motto, right, that's similar, right? Yeah, the French motto is actually very close to that. I mean, it's liberté, égalité, fraternité, which means liberty, equality, and fraternity. And it's pretty close to the American one, I guess. It's just pretty straightforward as well. Right, right, absolutely. And I know uh, our founding fathers were inspired by a lot of French philosophers like Rousseau and others, so... Yeah, and what's interesting, too, we talk about rights. We talk about how we want to be treated by our governing powers. Um, At the same time, you know, we also a lot of times talk about the golden rule. And what's interesting about the golden rule, I mean, in the country we live in, we're familiar with it uh, in terms of the Judeo-Christian sense of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And what's interesting is every major religion in the world has has the golden rule in their text. What's interesting to me is I love the Confucius version. In the Confucius version, it says, don't do unto others. Don't do unto others as you don't want someone to do to you. And I identify with that, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, there are many, that's how maybe I see how if I'm walking down the street, I don't want people to, you know, bother me, invade my space or treat me a certain way. <clears throat> and to me, that makes more sense than saying do. So um, a lot of times I want to enjoy my peace. And so anyway, um, I just find that very helpful to, to think of it that way. Yeah, I, I would say our our founding documents do line up more with the Confucius I, uh, way of thinking. It's basically keep your hands off. It's basically telling the government to... Uh, it, it's to keep from abuse of power, or it's to like you know keep your hands off of my life, right? Basically, like leave me alone. And that's how I <laughs> feel when it comes to the government and the police, right? Don't bother me. But, uh, so, so yeah, we can see that predating our founding fathers or predating you know the French advent of democracy, um, there were this idea of rights was, was going on with as far back as Confucius, like you said, all other 
religions and then you know the golden rule that, that we applied like to to jesus is set, stated in the more affirmative which is um even going beyond leaving people alone to enjoy their life and their liberty and their pursuit of happiness but um even going further but by like helping them right, right? so yeah, there's this other rule. I don't remember. It's like another metal rule, but it's uh, basically the same idea. But um, do unto others how, s how, like, treat others how they would want to be treated, right. not how you would want to be treated. But that, I think that's mm -hmm. like more uh, a more expanded version of it, which is a little complicated because you have to understand the other person and to really tr try to um, serve their be best interest and not your own and be honest about right. it. I guess. <laughs> oh, no, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah. If, th if you think about Western Europe specifically, our, which is our lineage here in the United States, and and for Lucy as a, a French person, you know, the advent, the birth of democracy was just starting to take hold in Europe. Like uh, the idea of getting rid of a tyrant, a monarch, um, and. Uh, the, the idea that each person actually has value and their life matters and they should be given uh, these inalienable rights. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've, we've gotten so used to this way of thinking and, and I guess it's almost hard to imagine the mindset of someone who wasn't introduced to this kind of thinking. Um, but I think it's one thing that's interesting about it now is it's almost like we don't even need to argue rationally that these rights exist or, and should be honored. It, it's almost like a visceral, emotional response. When you, right. see, when you see one of these rights being violated, let's say, um, you have an emotional response that this has to stop, this has to stop now, this <coughs> needs to be corrected, uh, we need to intervene. Um, so it's, it's like a visceral response when you see one of these rights being violated. Well, it's also that that reaches what, you know, some philosophers might just call basic belief, right? It doesn't need any justification. It's just, you know, it's wrong. You, like you just stated, you see something and you just have this reaction. Um, you know, some may argue, oh, we're trained that way. That I don't know if that, that's true or not, but um, for us, it's a basic belief. Well, I think that is an important aspect of this conversation. I think we're definitely trained to desensitize when it comes to certain groups here in our country. And many people point out these documents were written for white men. Mm. You know, <laughs> even though as we've evolved as a country, as we've evolved as a society, uh, you know, that has been broadened to include women, to include people of other races. Um, but yeah, we're, we're clearly able to be conditioned in and out of of mm. this kind of thinking, um, and then yeah, the idea that laws are put actually put into place to protect to protect these rights. Uh, the, the founding documents were really focused on protecting the indi individual from government from abuse of power. Like the the ten amendments, the uh, Bill of Rights, most of them are are helping um, support an individual who's been accused of a crime on how the government can deal with, can and cannot deal with them fairly. Uh, so it's protecting the individual. From, so it's basically, these laws are put into place to codify the idea that um, the powerless or those with less power should be protected from those who have power over them. So, so far, hopefully, everything we've said resonates. Um, that I f I hopefully... Everything we've said has been logical and um, something that we can all agree on. But we do want to transition a little bit into, if, if we do all agree, if this is all a given, that people have these inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, what about the non-human animals that we share this planet with? Do they have the exact same rights? Why or why not? Mm. Should they be protected under the law from those who have power over them? Does an animal have a right to their own life? Do, do they have a right 
to some degree of freedom, not being trapped or imprisoned? Does right. an animal have the right to pursue happiness in his or her own way? Right. I was just going to say that, too. We've talked about this, I think, in a previous show, but is a pig allowed to be a pig? Is a pig allowed to live as a pig? And just like yeah, the we, pursuit of happiness. Yeah, right. pursuit of happiness as a pig. And same for uh, prairie dogs and magpies and all the things around here, grizzly bears and wolves. And fish. And fish, yeah. <laughs> yeah, rainbow trout, brown trout. So this is a conversation that has been going on for centuries, for all, you know, all of human history. There have been people raising this type of question and um, having these kinds of, kinds of conversations. And um, today we're going to specifically look at an essay. It's about an 80-page essay um, by a, a British man, and his name was Henry S. Salt. Um, and he has this, I would call it a seminal piece of work, specifically about animals' rights. What is the full title of this essay? <coughs> I should have it right in front of me. Uh, animals' Rights Considered in Relation to Social Progress. Yeah. And it's considered the first essay on animal rights ever. Yeah, and it's interesting. It's like 63 pages, but it's jam-packed full yeah. of amazing information. Um, some of it's still, I mean, it almost seems like it was published yesterday. Yeah, yeah. It's, he, he's talking about and dealing with a lot of the same issues we're dealing with today. And, and you have to wonder, and, the, and what, what was it written, originally written in what, 1892? Yeah. And updated in 1922. That's still 100 years from today, over 100 years. And it's still considered extremely radical. <laughs> I know. It's like there hasn't been much progress in 100 years. You know exactly. So yeah, when you're when we're, I'm reading this, and Lucy is the one that introduced this this book or this essay to us. By the way, this is um, it's public domain um, through Gutenberg Press, I yeah. believe. So if you're interested Project, at all, Project Gutenberg online. Yeah, yeah, you can. And there's gonna be an ebook on YouTube that I'm recording, right. oh, nice. <laughs> free for sure. Oh, awesome. If you prefer ebooks, I mean um, audio versions. Yes. Yeah, so 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 interesting that this was published in originally in 1892. Um, everything you guys just said, it's it's still very radical. So which means it was probably even more radical right. during his time. So you know, hats off to Henry S. Salt. Oh, absolutely. For his his courage and his independent thinking. Um, you know, those are things. His we're courage all too. I have to imagine it was very courageous, and he speaks with such conviction through his words. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, they're completely unapologetic, which is very shocking to me because even to to this day, animals, animal rights um, activists and people can be apologetic sometimes because it gets in our head. Right. Uh, but he he was unapologetic when no one else was agreeing with him, which right. is very um, adm ad admirable. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred mm -hmm. percent. Yeah, so we we really think it's just worth the time to kind of go through this essay and um, comment on on some of the things he said. Um, it's really laid out in a really systematic, logical, really nicely organized way. There's eight chapters, so we're just going to spend a few minutes on each chapter. Um, interestingly, it, it occurred to me that it's kind of laid out similarly to the way that um, the documentary Dominion is structured in terms, I think that documentary kind of breaks down, you know, looking at how animals are treated when they're raised for food, looking how wild animals are treated when they're captured or hunted, um, the fashion industry, animals that get caught up in that, um, entertainment. Uh, so it's kind of a similar structure. Uh, I also just kind of wanted to mention as re as I was reading this I was like oh I really think that this was kind of an original source for people following him that, because it, it it was so similar to like chapters out of for instance uh, Peter Singer's book right um, animal liberation yeah, yeah so like this is this has definitely been an inspiration and a source for um, thinkers who have come after him right so in the first chapter, Henry Salt uh, is laying out his philosophical argument for why these rights should apply to animals. So chapter one, the principle of animals' rights. And 
one of his main arguments in this chapter and throughout the essay really that we really need to get out of this mindset that we had traditionally had um, in the science field as well as um, through religion um, that humans are distinctly separate in every way from the rest of the animal kingdom. He's really trying to pull out that, you know, that way of thinking is not intellectually honest. Um, science has shown us in so many ways that we vary from each other by degree only. We do not vary from each other in kind. Uh, we're kind of more similar, not kind of, we are more similar to the animals in so many ways, and they're more similar to us in so many ways than we are different. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that's going to come up again and again throughout the essay. And one of the quotes from this chapter that just jumped right out at me is a quote from Charles Darwin. Uh, he says, the fallacious idea that the lives of animals have no moral purpose is at root connected with these religious and philosophical pretensions, which Schopenhauer so powerfully condemns. To live one's own life, to realize one's true self, is the highest moral purpose of man and animal alike. So that just rings of you know those three inalienable, inalienable rights, the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to pursue happiness and that animals possess their due measure of this sense of individuality is scarcely open to doubt. We have seen, says Darwin, that the senses and intuitions, the various emotions and faculties, such as love, memory, attention, curiosity, imitation, reason, etc., of which man boasts, may be found in an incipient or even sometimes in a well-developed condition in the lower animals. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting because that was written, again, back in 1892, uh, updated in 1922. And yeah, you would think back then, uh, especially if you understand Darwinian evolution, right, that um, many people say, we are a continuation, right? That it's, it's a it's just this long, progressive continuation uh, from, you know, the first, I don't want to call it the first, you know, microorganism to man. Mm -hmm. It's this continuous thing. It's this long chain that we're all a part of. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting that um, somehow religion got involved with Thomas Aquinas and philosopher Descartes and all these other people, and they made this demarcation saying animals don't have souls. They can't. They don't feel. They can't rationalize. And then somehow science, somewhere in this equation, picked that up too and went with that demarcation. And it's just interesting because you'd think science would have said, and anyone who believes in Darwinian evolution or any kind of evolution would see that progression, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like it's like, like what we mentioned in our past show, about how scientists are humans as well, and we, we all have biases. Even if scientists who are trying to not <laughs> act from biases, they always do anyways, right. uh, because we're just humans. But it's interesting. It is interesting. And also because now like it's literally proven. like The, the DNA we share with um, non-human animals is so much greater than like the amount of DNA that we don't, that right. we have different from them. Right. You know? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. You think... It's uh, like objective... Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like there is this disconnect, and this is what we find in our culture, right? There are all these little silos of knowledge, and, and we we're not cohesive, we're not coherent, we're not holistic in our thinking. Um, and consistent. What's, what's more challenging to believe that an animal has an almost identical nervous system to a human? They have skin that can feel, and you know, mouths taste, you know, tongues that can taste, and eyes that can see, and ears that can hear. But somehow, we're going to believe that they don't feel and they don't think and they don't have emotions. And, you know, like, like it seems such a, right. a more difficult <laughs> leap right. mm -hmm. to, to yeah, do what we've done for centuries. Logical. No, it's absolutely. You read any natural history book, Stephen Jay Gould, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Um, what's his, Sean, Sean, what's his face? Sean, Sean, Sean Colin, what's, oh God, Sean B. Carroll. Any of those kinds of books. 
You know what I mean? I mean, it's all there. You know what I mean? Uh, the development of everything you're saying, the development of the eye, the development of all these things that we have as humans. You know, there's this progression, and it just doesn't make any sense that it works for us, but it doesn't work for them, as mm-hmm. Descartes would have us believe. Right. Right, and then, you know, Henry Saul is in this chapter is also kind of tackling this phenomenon that um, with any kind of progressive movement towards increasing our awareness, or our increasing our compassion, increasing our reverence for different groups of people or different groups, period, um, there's always a lot of resistance, right? Um, he mentioned something quite funny. So um, Mary Wollstone uh, Crafts uh, wrote an essay in 1792, and he f- refers to it, and it's called Vindication of the Rights of Women. And uh, so there was, um, uh, that same year, someone anonymously published a book that was a reductio ad, uh, ad absurdum, basically making fun of that book <laughs> that she wrote. And it was uh, called... A vindication, a vindication, sorry, of the rights of brutes. And so he said basically about that, like that the person, after those wonderful productions of Mr. Payne, who wrote a book about the rights of men, like he was called Rights of Men, and Mrs. Wollstonecraft, such a theory as the present seems to be necessary. So he was... <laughs> Um, it was, it's pretty funny because right after this quote, um, Henry Assault says, it was necessary, <laughs> actually. Right. Um, it's interesting that this person was, was basically trolling um, the, wom- the women's rights essay and also the, the, the rights of men essay, which is interesting. Uh, came mm. at them with this idea that animals' rights is completely absurd and it's so ridiculous and that's how I'm going to disprove your points, right? Because when does it end? And then you get Henry Sol- S. Solders like, actually, <laughs> yeah. you were right. Uh, you were, you're trying to make fun of it, but it's actually, you were absolutely right. That's where we're headed. Because we we're enlarging, like we're widening our circle of compassion. Right. And um, yeah, that's how it works, basically. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. And, and so there's this very uh, fun quote by Schopenhauer. It made me think about this. Um, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. Mm-hmm. And obviously, this was like the first, the the first time that you actually talk about animals' rights or any any like different social group or um, and and their rights. You always get this ridicule. Like if you. In the past, it was gay rights uh, and women's rights, even like slavery issues. Right. And it's always like that. Like in, in it's very clear in this quote and this like um, book that he made to make fun of um, women's rights that this is where it was at. Ridicule. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Right, and he the fact that he'd written his book a hundred years after that <laughs> that quote is like, funny. Actually, <laughs> that's great. So I mean it, that kind of speaks to the compartmentalization uh, that we're as that we as humans are just so good at, you know. We see how someone can be so enlightened and so progressive, and so intelligent, and well read in in certain areas, and then other areas we're just we are, we're capable of being totally uh, at contradiction with with those things and um, having areas of our lives that we've been very unconscious of and haven't really looked at you know so in this situation the idea that okay yeah this group of people has certain inalienable rights but that group doesn't and that group doesn't and that group doesn't it it almost feels almost schizophrenic in a way and it's it's also true of how we view animals isn't it like uh you know henry salt talks about like it's so great in his context at his time in history uh, for the first time in the Western world, there was a law on the books um, from 1822 known as the Martins Act, which was uh, making it illegal. Uh, the Ill Treatment of Cattle Bill is also known as Martins Act. So basically, th- for the first time, there were consequences for mistreating your beast of burden, your, uh, your animal laborers, but it only... It only applied 
to beasts of burden. It only applied to cattle um, and horses, no other animals. And you know, uh, to me, that speaks in our context to exactly what we do. Um, you know, people love their dogs, and their dogs become part of their family. And you can get arrested and charged if it's proven that you have been cruel to your dog or right. your cat. Uh, so we have laws on the books to protect against animal cruelty for some species of animals. Uh, but then there's many, many other species of animals that literally have no protection uh, under the law. And so again, this schizophrenia, this, this compartmentalization that really cannot be defended intellectually. Right. Like if you really look at it, there is no real rational reason for, for that difference. Right. It's cultural. And, and here you have someone in the 1800s like talking about speciesism before it's even a word and before even vegan is a word. Right. So that's, that's just so mind-blowing to me. Right. No, but again, we, we say this almost every episode, right? The, the power of culture is, is very powerful. And it, it, it trumps rational, logical thinking many times. Which is what makes this individual, Henry S. Salt, from the late 1800s, so worth celebrating. Mm -hmm. right. Because somehow he was able to think outside of his culture uh, and write this amazing work. Yeah, in some ways he's like a prophet. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, he's just like out of crazy. place. He's out of place. It's crazy. Um, another thing that jumped out to me in this first chapter was that he he really addresses that let's really be careful about the terms, the actual words we use when we're talking about animals. And I was like, whoa, that sounds so contemporary. Like, I thought that was kind of a new idea in our generation to, to stop and be like, um, instead of calling people slaves, let's call these people... Um, you know, enslaved people. Yeah. Um, instead of calling animals farm animals, let's call them farmed animals. You know, it's just, it kind of is a way of, with our words, being very careful about what we're saying. And so, you know, even the idea of, uh, he, he names the idea of um, calling an animal an it instead of he or she, um, or calling animals, you know, brute beasts, or dumb animals, or livestock, you know, and that's definitely one that is still in common parlance today, uh, livestock. We just say it without even thinking, but what is it really saying? It's saying that this is a commodity that happens to be alive, <laughs> you know, instead of calling it, no, this is an individual um, with, with their own rights of, to life, you know, to uh, to some liberty and, s and to some pursuit of happiness. It reminds me of uh, when people like get attached to animals that they will like slaughter or something like that, and they, they say don't name them, because then it gives them the the individuality. I mean, it just recognizes really. It doesn't give them the individuality. It recognizes that they are an individual, and that therefore they have uh, value to their life. Right. And it's very much in the same vein. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that, I just want to say that reminds me earlier when you were saying, like, when we talk about human inalienable rights, kind of what you started with, like, the fact that we are here, the fact that we exist, um, it's just, like we said, it's, uh, we, we use the term basic belief, but earlier we said it's self-evident, self-evident that we have some rights just by the fact that we're humans. Well, you have to wonder then in this progression, right, just by the fact that these animals exist on this planet, and they live a certain way, and they should have the freedom to have the rights just for being who they are, for just existing. And also, like, um, he addresses that, actually. Uh, the, um, you know, like, like the, the kind of people will often ask you, well, where does it end, right? Like, what about plants, etc.? And it's like, well, do we need to actually eat animals to survive and be healthy? No, because science shows we don't. We need to eat plants for now. <laughs> so it's kind of like, how can we expand our circle of compassion in a way that's actually possible? Because that is actually 
part of the vegan de de definition. I mean, obviously this book does not know <laughs> that the word vegan wasn't invented until like half a century later, but it's, uh, I think it's something to mention right. <laughs> really quickly because totally. veganism is about doing like this. It's about being against animal exploitation and use in the ways that are actually practicable, but like truly practical, not like I don't feel like it, mm. but like it's literally possible. So I'm going to do it. Right. Mm hmm. Right. I mean, uh, going back to the idea of livestock, calling an animal livestock, I and especially in light of this idea of, of the right to life, you know, if you think about livestock, literally the day they're born, the, the day of their execution has already been planned. You know, they have been bred into existence for the very purpose, the explicit purpose and the singular purpose of being killed. Uh, or uh, if they're like an egg producing hen or if they're a milk producing cow, they're bred to get as much out of them as humanly possible and then they are killed. So their right to life doesn't exist basically. So um, just something to kind of frame it that way. And I find it interesting, it's like livestock as well as fish. When you talk about fish, you don't actually talk about the individuals or livestock is the same. It's like it's kind of like a, uh, it's like a part of sugar. <laughs> it's like, it's not even individuals. You don't even recognize them as separate entities that are individuals. Oh, yeah. And I think that's very powerful because when you look up the number of fish, for example, that, that are killed every year, you don't, you can't even know how many because they, they, they do it by weight. Mm -hmm. They know by weight. Mm -hmm. So it's literally not even in their death are they recognized are as individuals. Wow. That's They're just a, a weight of life. Wow. That's and an that's very powerful. Well, I that's think. an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah, I appreciate that you said that because it's true. It's almost like they're just a mass of, like the mass of them is one thing instead of each individual having any kind of consideration. Imagine if you did that to humans or to dogs, you right. know? Mm -hmm. Right. I think, you know, I think we're about to wrap up the first chapter, but um, we do need to kind of tip our hats to Jeremy Bentham once again. Um, we got to celebrate him because he is quoted uh, in this first chapter. Um, and part of that quote, I'm just, just trying to decide how much of it to read because it's all so good. <laughs> so he said, the legislator, he wrote, ought to interdict everything which may serve to lead to cruelty. The barbarous spectacle of gladiators no doubt contributed to give the Romans that ferocity which they displayed in their civil wars. A people accustomed to despise human life in their games could not be expected to respect it amid the fury of their passions. It is proper for the same reason to forbid every kind of cruelty toward animals, whether by way of amusement or to gratify gluttony, Cockfights, bull baiting, hunting hares and foxes, fishing, and other amusements of the same kind necessarily suppose either the absence of reflection or a fund of inhumanity, since they produce the most acute sufferings of to sensible beings and the most painful and lingering death of which we can form any idea. Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? The time will come when humanity will extend its mantle over everything which breathes. We have begun by attending to the conditions of, of slaves. We shall finish by softening that to, of all the animals which assist our labors or supply our wants. So interesting, he does bring in the plight of the enslaved people that we've just started to recognize that those people deserve rights, that they have rights. Mm. Um, but we shouldn't stop there. We should, we should expand that to recognize that animals have rights as well. It's like inevitable kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no, it's quite a quote. It's similar to Henry Saul, right? I mean, it's very forward thinking for his time. And it is interesting. It's worth commenting, right, on what he's saying about the Romans and the gladiators, right? That when... You make human uh, death a spectacle um, when, you know, that's just something about maybe your, the level of 
I want to say the way your culture idols at, so to speak, so that when you do go to war, the way you might treat your enemies might be at a higher level because you're used to human killing as some sort of sensational circus act. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it desensitizes to such it, a degree. It does desensitize, and it and it and so it just it's an interesting quote. It it says something about where we should be practicing um, humaneness, you know, as a culture, as a people. The case of domestic animals is chapter two, and of course, um, we need to keep in mind um, Henry Salt's context, his historical context uh, in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. When he talks about domestic animals, um, it might be a little bit different than the way we would think. Um, he does talk about uh, pets at the end of the chapter, but primarily what he's talking about when he talks about domestic animals um, is the beasts of burden. Um, so even though this is technically after the Industrial Revolution, um, you know we know that change is gradual. And so during Salt's time, there, most people um, who could afford it were helped with their labor by um, owning a beast of burden and or used animals to transport people um, from place to place. This is something that, you know, we, I hadn't really thought about in depth um, in terms of maybe this is it, one way we can say, oh, the fate of animals has improved over history. Um, be, you know, because today we don't really use animals quite the same way um, for our labor and for our transportation. Um, so he says, an incalculable mass of drudgery at the cost of incalculable suffering is daily, hourly performed for the benefit of man by these honest, patient laborers in every town and country of the world. So... That's his primary focus, uh, is the animals that help us with our work, or, or did at, during his time. Uh, so he mentions two more acts of legislation that came around, um, the Act of 1849, um, which kind of furthered Martin's Act. Um, basically, all domestic animals were now, um, th there was a penalty uh, which could be imposed for cruelty to any animal. But they use the word and the phrase any animal, but that they, they do specify it. Basically, horses, cows, mules, uh, sheep, uh, pigs, and dogs or cats. So basically, the animals we think of as domesticated um, are the animals that were covered under the Act of 1849. Uh, of course, it's it's... All of these little pieces of legislation are huge in that they set a precedent that animals can be protected under law, uh, but you know they all kind of fall short in terms of their scope. Um, but that law, the Act of 1849, was amended in 1900 to it was amended by the Wild Animals in Captivity Act of 1900. Uh, this made it an offense to maltreat a wild animal while actually in a state of captivity. Wow. And we know that, I think, during that part of history, again, the late, eight, late 19th century, early or early 20th century, it was still very much a part of the accepted culture to kidnap wild animals and, and put them on, on display, you know, circuses. And obviously, that's where zoos started really becoming a big thing. And... Um, and all over the place. And I, even there, I feel like our sensibilities have evolved um, over time. Mm. Like, I think it's less acceptable to keep wild animals in captivity. I mean, it did that with certain humans, too. Right. So. That's right. And these laws, were they from Britain? Yes. So this is all in the context of Great Britain. Right. So it, I know. I was thinking about that, too. It would be interesting to do some s research into... You know, was the United States kind of tracking along these lines at the same time, or or not? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious about that. Yeah, but but these were the first Martin's Law of 1849 was the first anti-cruelty. That was eight, bill. Martin's Law was 1822. 1822. And then we have the Act of 1849 amended in 1900. Okay. Yeah. Um. So. 
Salt's argument is basically, okay, maybe we cannot completely eradicate the phenomenon of our animals doing so much labor for us or transporting humans from place to place. But can we at least protect them and take care of them? And um, he quotes a man named Humphrey Primitt, who said that there should be three rights of the domestic animals, food, rest, and tender usage. Mm. Um, so if we, if we fast forward to our context, especially when we're looking at farmed animals, they're given food to survive. And um, you know, if, you, if we think of the state of the dairy cow, not really given rest. She's on a constant cycle of impregnation, delivery, and lactation um, for her short life. Uh, tender usage, basically, you know, not whipping them, not f being cruel, not being physically violent with them. Something to think about. So I would say even not overusing them. When I when I hear yeah. tender usage, I'm like, yeah, like normal like usage throughout the day, but like overuse seems yeah, to me it's a little it's a little contradictory. <laughs> usage, tender usage is like. Like if you put a human in that in that uh, in the place of the non-human animal, is there a way to use them in a way like meaning in a way that's not in their best interest, but tenderly? Mm. That's just like, mm -hmm. can you have a like, can you use a slave tenderly? Right. Like no, you have to pay them. Right. <laughs> or even a human laborer. I mean, there are reasons why we've <coughs> had labor reforms because right. corporations. Same with you know the way that we look at animals often. Humans have been looked at that way. Like, let's get as much out of this person without regard to whether they need rest, right. time to, you know, recover. Um, right. Leisure. Enjoy life a little bit. Mm -hmm. 100%. It just, because uh, to, to me that would seem like an abuse. Like, tender usage to me would indicate not to overuse. And if we think about what we're doing to uh, farmed animals today, absolutely 100 percent. you think of the dairy cow yeah but it's interesting also to think about the term abuse and and use because like isn't abuse like using someone the wrong way like in a way that is against their best interests mm -hmm. yes and because so it is not in any of their best interests. no and i would i would <laughs> agree exactly i would say overuse well i would just say overuse is abuse and i would say yeah if, if you're using somebody who doesn't want to be used that way that is abuse if, yeah. yeah if you're an enslaved animal and you're being used as brute force Oh, well, even use just <clears throat> did take your milk anything. from you, yeah. Anything. Well, if we want to go that way, we could say Commodifying. pets. Yeah. We could say pets. Yeah, and he talks about it as well. Uh, right. Actually, in this chapter, he talks about, um, you know, like uh, the way we treat our pets. Is it, is it much better in the, in the sense of their own dignity? Right. Not in the sense of like tender usage, but necessarily as much. But yeah. well, no, I, I think of the, the thing that blows me away is people who declaw their cats mm -hmm. that are going to be indoor cats. And then if that cat ever gets out and what are the chances that that cat might get out and then it can't defend itself properly because it's been declawed. I mean, that's just one example of, yeah. of, of potentially abuse and using an animal in a way that was, it was not intended. Mm. Or and that he, they that, cannot consent to. That doesn't like, even sound right. Not using, an animal, yeah. using an animal, using an animal way was not intended. We were, they weren't intended to be used. So that's a, that was a weird phrase, but. Um. This uh, this conversation uh, just reminded me of um, the Ten Commandments in Hebrew Scripture. the The fourth commandment is where God tells um, His people to have it one day of the week where they're not supposed to produce or work or achieve. They're just supposed to have a day of rest and a day of peace. Um, and the commandment, when this is something that's unfortunately glossed over um, in my experience, but the, the commandment also says that even your servants and your slaves should have a day of rest and your animals your livestock, your um, your beasts of burden should have a day where they're not required to do any work for you. So, you know, even dating all the way back to, what do we call that, ancient times? Right. Yeah, the ancient times, there was an idea that even coming from, the, from God, 
for the Hebrew people that they should have a day where they just let their their laboring animals rest. Right. And he mentions uh, in this chapter as well that there is like a lot that they can't basically predict. And he was actually very aware that technology would take off and probably mm. solve a lot of issues uh, about animals' rights. And he, I mean, animal rights, sorry. And he was right because obviously we don't we don't use animals for transport apart from like like some carriage horse carriages or something. But right. yeah, it's like a novelty. <laughs> yeah, it's a novelty, and there even there they're getting abused. I mean, yeah, of course it's abuse, right. but uh, it's way less uh, in terms of scale right. than it used to be. Exactly. Um, so he he talks about the cabs in England. He says, "Watch the cab traffic in one of the crowded thoroughfares of our great cities." Always the same lugru- lugubrious, patient procession of underfed, overloaded animals. The same brutal insolence of the drivers. The same accursed sound of the whip. And remembering that these horses are gifted with a large degree of sensibility and intelligence. Must one not feel that the fate to which they are thus mercilessly subjected is a shameful violation? And he goes on to say, and then when your animal gets old or injured or too broken to do your work for you anymore or to uh, you know, pull the cab, uh, then they are just killed. Um, he says they're sold often to the cat's meat man, which I'm assuming, mm. I guess I didn't look that up. <laughs> I'm assuming that means you're, they're sold to become pet food. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a quote in here about how um, I think it was from one of the ancient Greeks. I'm looking <coughs> right here, but basically, yeah, that it's man's duty to take care of his beasts of burden, not just when they're young and virile, but even when they get old and can't work for you anymore. I just looked it up. Cat meets man. Uh, it's Victorian era London. Was there was a job for a cat? Cats meets man. It was like the ice cream man, but with giving away fresh meat to cats. Uh, very interesting. And almost like it comes from the era of uh, Dickens. So <laughs> isn't that interesting? <laughs> so, yeah, like I mentioned, he does uh, spend a little bit of time on talking about pets, um, which is what we think about in terms of the case of domestic animals. Um, but has some maybe controversial things to say about pet ownership. Um, It goes something like, let's see, uh, it may be doubted indeed whether the condition of the household pet is in the long run more enviable than that of the beast of burden. Pets are usually the recipients of an abundance of sentimental affection, but of little real kindness. So much easier it is to give temporary caresses than substantial justice. Domestic animals do not exist for the mere idle amusement any more than for the mere commercial profit of its human owner. They're turned into a useless puppet. And uh, let's see. The injustice done to the pampered lap dog is as conspicuous in its way as that done to the overworked horse. And both spring from one and the same origin. The fixed belief that the life of a quote unquote brute has no moral purpose, no distinctive personal- personality worthy of due consideration and development. In a society where the lower animals were regarded as intelligent beings and not as animated machines, it would be impossible for this incongruous absurdity to continue. So that's a little controversial. <laughs> Yeah. What do we, what do we think of his um, description of what it's like to be uh, someone's pet? It, re- I mean, in my opinion, it reminds me of people who dress up their animals and the animals hate it. Right. <laughs> it's like, uh, what are you treating them like um, someone, or are you treating treating them like something? Yeah. You know, well, what I mean, about their best interests? Well, I feel exactly their best interests, but in that sense, they're being used for your own entertainment. Exactly. Because then you're gonna doll them up really cute and then take a picture and show all your friends and, Mm -hmm. you know. Right. A lot of people point out, you know, we, oh, we love, we love our pets so much, but that love only goes so far. That love only, oh, I've, (coughs) I've noticed 
as a pet owner and at, you know, um, noticing other pet owners. As soon as that relationship becomes inconvenient or messy or expensive or yeah, in, like infringes on your own freedom, suddenly you don't love that pet so much. <laughs> They're a real pain and people leaving their pets all day long while they go out to work and their pet is panicked and bored and right. um, you know how humane is that how loving is that or you know people who can't take their animal on vacations with them so they leave them with a stranger and then that pet is terrified the whole time that they're never going to see their family again right. or stranger to the animal yeah right. and they have yeah. a, the intelligence of often like a toddler or something like right so it yeah. is similar right but then you also have the other situation where you know some people consider them parents of pets do you know what i mean mm -hmm. um where they go and they do get these expensive surgeries and they do extend their life and they do mm. spend a lot of money time and right expense on these animals on these pets it's a, a very interesting phenomenon like it's, it's like well okay at least this animal is getting gently used and is getting rest and is getting food and is getting affection um, that's obviously a superior life in many ways to an animal that is imprisoned and neglected and abused. Um, right. But it, it's <clears throat> it's worth thinking about, especially in terms of um, if we're continuing to create more and more of these pets. Right. Uh, and so many of them are, are end up being homeless uh, and euthanized. Um, it, and then we have to support animal agriculture we have to support the slaughter of other animals to feed our pets which by um, the way there's vegan cat food that's been you know approved by veterinarians now uh, i so. need to look into that yeah, yeah yeah for cat food as well which is because they need certain nutrients uh but there's a nutrient profile that you can get actually from plants and so they, they figured out this like this uh nutrient profile and it's actually been approved like it's been studied and everything nice you can have a, a vegan cat and a vegan dog it's much easier for dogs yeah, yeah, huh. yeah. So, just a lot to think about. Yeah, and um, also like w something that I think is very important to talk about is the fact that we have domesticated these animals to the point that they could not actually live in the wild and survive and and thrive. Yeah. I think as humans, we have now a responsibility to these individuals to actually just take care of them because we we messed them up really. Like right. you know, and it, it's irreparable t at this point. And so really the conversation, the difficult conversation to have is like, what do we do? Do we, you know, to, do we make sure that they, they're not bred, you know, so that we don't make their problem worse? Well, that, that, or but do that, we that is, that them, is you know? I think that is the root of the problem yeah. is that we're breeding. And the then it's like, yeah, but things. do they have a right to having mm. like, you know, um, children? I mean, you know, kittens or whatever. It's also something to consider, but it's, I find that to be a pretty difficult conversation. Oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting yeah. thought, right? We go and we spade and neuter our animals. It's um, like, what is actually in their best interest? Right. Or what, what, not only that, best interest, what, is, what do they want? Yeah, but it's kind of hard to... <laughs> because obviously they want to reproduce, but it's like also, well, how, like, it's, do we give them birth control? Because that's a thing. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's a very... It's, I, f I feel like it's a pretty great area that needs to be discussed mm. anyways, but... Yeah, we yeah. will evolve there in, yeah. our, in our thinking. There's a lot to think about. Right. <coughs> right. I, and I think it's a lot easier to think about, okay, so we agree that humans have inalienable rights, you know, and, and like we've kind of boiled it down to just life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And maybe we feel like those rights might apply to animals in some cir circumstances or to some degree or to the nth degree, you know, I mean, it's there again, it's, it's a matter of, okay, well, can it, can we at least admit that, that animals should have some protection from unnecessary suffering? Um, you know, like this is just kind of a conversation that we're just kind of scratching the surface, just starting to think about and discuss. Well, I think I think what blows my mind, I think I would love to have a show on pets, but also right now what's a big deal these days or at least in some people's minds is AI. And some people are saying that artificial intelligence, some are saying it's already sentient. Some are saying it's about to be sentient in a couple of years. 
And we're, we're acknowledging that a computer program is sentient, but we're still questioning whether animals are sentient. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. And, and to me, because then, then we're going to get into robot or uh, artificial intelligence rights. Do you know what I'm saying? And we, mm-hmm. haven't, even, we haven't even covered animal rights. And, and yet we're well on our way because it's advancing so quickly. And so that's just an interesting thing to think about. If, if, we, ever, if we ever declare that, that um, AI is sentient, then it should just be automatic, in my view, that animals are sentient. It's, it's a nice little loop with Car- the Cartesian thinking because it's like, well, animals are machines. Well, well <laughs> what, what does that mean now? Because <laughs> AI, you know, like, I mean, does that mean that does that better because machines might become sentient? I mean, and something I wanted to mention real quick about um, what he says about what's possible and what, like the fact that we have to use uh, animals to some degree because it's impossible in their society, whatever, in 1800 something. I, I, what I took away from it was that in this transition, it's not going to be perfect. We are going to mm-hmm. be uh, disrespecting the rights of individuals, of these animals, but... Um, the the end goal is the the rights of these individuals to be recognized just like humans are and it's like the right to life like we, we mentioned the rights uh, already right 100 so it's like a trend like it's not black or white for now but it, the goal is to be like having them have rights and not mm-hmm. being so gray mm-hmm. absolutely right all we can ever do is our best in right. the given moment where we are right and be honest about it right <laughs> yeah yeah, so this is going to be a two-part conversation. Um, we did. We there's a lot to get through with this essay, so this is part one. It might be oh. three if we c- carry on like no, that. I think no, I, I think we could do. I think we can get it. We'll done get it done in, next. And yeah. one more hour. <coughs> um, but yeah, it was a good conversation to at least get us started. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll play this, and next time you'll hear our second part. All right. Until next time, we'll see you later. Live vegan. Yeah. Live vegan. <laughs>